Church, let's stand and let's worship him this morning. Thank you. 
someone new, say hello, all right? You got two minutes, two minutes. All right. How's everyone doing this morning? Oh, that's what I like to hear. I still got my ears on. Yes. Hallelujah. Let them use you. Let them use you. Uh, <laughs> all right. Listen, if this is your very first time here at Legacy Church, welcome. Welcome home. All right. We do have a connection card for you to fill out, okay? We ask for your name, phone number, address, social security number, credit card number, um, with the security code. <laughs> Hey, I got student loans. I'm just saying. Okay, anyway. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, we want you to fill this out so we can connect with you, okay? We want to reach out, see how you're doing, if there's anything you need, if you have any prayer requests, because um, we just want to get to know you, all right? How you guys doing this morning? You guys feeling good? You look good? See, this is why you don't give me a mic, because then I just start talking. I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, we got just a few announcements this morning, okay? Who knows that next Friday is Good Friday? Yes. I've been accidentally calling it Black Friday. <laughs> Who knows, it's Black Friday in my house every Friday, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, uh, but you know, next Friday is Good Friday, and we are super excited to celebrate and to remember what Jesus has done for us. Amen. How you guys been feeling about this fast for the last few weeks? Yeah. Let me, let me tell you something. He empties out stuff, and you got to fill it back up with him. Amen. Don't let it just sit there. Let him fill you back up. And so um, next Friday, we'll have, next Friday is Good Friday, so we'll have our Good Friday service from 7 to 8, and then we'll have our glow hut. Who's excited about the glow hut? Woo! Let me tell you, we're going to be light up out here, okay? We're going to have some glow sticks, bring your flashlights. It's going to be a lot, of, a lot of fun. Let's pray that the rain doesn't come, all right? We can hold off for a few days, amen? And then this next, this coming Tuesday, because I said next Tuesday for the service. Um, <laughs> sorry, this coming Tuesday, we have our sisterhood Bible study from 6 to 7.30, Raise your hand if you go to our um, sisterhood um, Bible studies. Whoop, whoop. 
Yes, they have been phenomenal, okay? And there will be child care. Josh was here earlier. Pray for him. He a little broken up, <laughs> okay? But we know God's going to restore him and heal him, amen? And so we just believe that God is doing an amazing work here, amen? Hallelujah. We are so glad that we let God move the way he needs to move, right? So, and I pray that you keep that attitude, keep that perspective, keep that spirit up because there's so much work that needs to be done. Amen. So let's stand up on our feet <clears throat> this morning as we get back into worship. This is our time of giving and giving is a form of worship and we give cheerfully. Amen. And we do without complaining because that's what he asked for us to be obedient. Hallelujah. So God, let's pray that you just bless this offering, Lord God. And bless everyone here who is giving out of the abundance of their heart and their spirit. And those who feel like they have nothing to give, remind them that they are in the inheritance of you. They are in the inheritance of you, Lord Jesus. So no matter what it is, God, I pray that we give it cheerfully. And we remind ourselves that if God can do everything for us, if no one's against us, if Jesus can lay down his whole life for us, that all we can do is worship you fully and with a cheerful heart. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you can come up.
we're going to sing the bridge again. But I think you guys need to understand that there's nothing that can keep God's love from you. No shadow, no walls that you put up, because like it says, he comes to kick them down. There's nothing that can keep him from you. So I really want you to think about that as we sing the bridge. that it doesn't matter that we couldn't earn it, God, that we don't deserve it, God, but you still give that unconditional, reckless love to us, God. You leave the 99 for the one, God. And we just give you all the glory and all the honor, God, because you deserve it, God. We thank you, God. As we go on to our next song, if we could have the prayer team up here. And if you need prayer for anything or agreeance for anything, that is why they are up there. You may come up at any time. But I just want to challenge you on this next song to give your all. Some of you may have come with baggage or may have had a rough week or whatever. But I challenge you to just give your all because he deserves it.
God, we just speak your name over every situation, God. God, over every life. God, every prayer request. God, everything that is going on in our lives this morning. God, we speak your name over our family. We speak your name over our relationships. God, we speak your name over healings that need to take place. God, because your name is powerful. In your name, there is life, God. So God, we speak the name of Jesus. Jesus. God, we call on you to come and rescue us. Jesus. God, we call on you to forgive us of our sins. Jesus, we call on you. God, in the middle of our mess, God, in the midst of the chaos that is surrounding us, we call out the name of Jesus, and there is peace. God, in the middle of our pain, we call out the name of Jesus, and there is, God, there is healing. God, in the middle of our situation, whatever it is, whatever it looks like, we can call out on your name, and there is always an answer. God, you will always answer. So Jesus, we call out your name. We depend only on your name. Jesus, we need you. And nothing else. Jesus, we need you. So God, we thank you. We praise you. God, I praise you for all that you've done already this morning. God, for lives that have been changed. God, healings that have taken place. Relationships that have been strengthened. God, we love you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Man, you may be seated. stuff good stuff there's just something about <laughs> being in the presence of God that nothing else compares to it <laughs> nothing else can do what a minute in the presence of God can do and so we thank God for his presence and for his uh his spirit just here in this place we are uh winding down our series our empty series that we have been in since uh, the, the end of February, all through the month of March, uh, we've gone along with our 40-day our fast, which is winding down this week. We have six more days through Saturday, and then Sunday, the, the, the fast is ended. And so, uh, man, let me encourage you this week again, finish strong, whatever it is that you have been fasting over these last uh, 30, 29 days, I guess, coming up on, or no, 33, 34, I can't do math this morning, it's okay. Uh, whatever you've been fasting though, if, if you want to do the same thing, if you want to add something, if you want to change it, but finish out this fast strong because I believe this week God is going to do, continue to do some amazing things like he's already done in the middle of this fast and we're just so excited for our, our Good Friday service um, the time that we're going to get to spend, let me tell you, it is going to be a powerful time of just the word and worship on Friday um, at, at 7 o'clock. We want everybody to come and be here. We're going to take communion together as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus and what he did for us that night all those years ago and, and just going to have an awesome time. And then we're going to have a blast afterwards with the, with the Easter egg hunt. Continue to pray that the, that the rain 
quits before Friday, so that way we can have a little bit of a dryness out there. We're not, you know, traipsing the kids out there through all the mud and everything. If it is raining or if it is too muddy, we will still have it. We'll just move it indoors into our annex and our nursery area. So even if it is raining, still bring the kids. We're going to have a great time with that Friday night, right? So we are going to, uh, like I said, wrap up kind of this series today as we're, we've been talking about empty and the idea of pouring out all of the things in our lives that, that have just stored up, that we have, we have allowed into our lives, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that have kept us from being who God has called us to be, that have kept us from doing what God has called us to be. We talked about uh, through each day of the week of the Passion Week, and I love this series, I love doing it this way, because it allows us on this Sunday to really focus on, on Thursday. And so many times for churches and Easter, you get going and you have, today is Palm Sunday, today is the triumphal entry, and, and they get together on Palm Sunday and they focus solely on that, and we kind of miss what happens for the rest of the week, right? And how important what Jesus did every single day, and especially what he did Thursday evening with his disciples. And so we get to focus on that today as we've gone through this series, because we started, like I said, uh, over a month ago with, with Sunday, with Palm Sunday that first week, and we talked about Bartimaeus, and we talked about the triumphal entry and how they were all crying out for Jesus to come and heal them of their pain. And we talked about the importance of pouring out our pain. That was the first step in emptying ourselves, is pouring out our pain and the hurt and the things that we've carried that has kept us from God. So we talked about that, and then we talked about um, pouring out my religion, what happened on Monday when Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, cursed the fig tree, he cleared out the temple, and we talked about the importance of pouring out those things, those in a sense, those idols in our life that we have allowed to take hold, to, to come in between us and our relationship with God, even things that are of a religious stature, a religious nature, and how important it is that we're not just showing the leaves of religiosity, but we're producing the fruit that God asks us to produce. And so we talked about that. That's what happened Monday. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about pouring out my agenda on Tuesday. Jesus came to the temple, and there were four different groups of people that came and challenged him with questions and how each one of them came and presented their agenda, what they wanted, and said, this is what's important to me, basically. Jesus, do you agree, or will you bless this? Will you agree and side with me on this sort of thing? Until the last man who came and asked the right question, what is most important to you, right? What is the most important commandment and how we need to approach Jesus in that same way, not coming to him with our agenda, not coming to him with what we want, but coming to him and asking him, what is most important to you, God, and help me to do that thing. And so um, last week, Crystal just killed it as she talked about pouring out my worth on Wednesday, the lady who came and anointed the feet of Jesus with the, with the uh, jar of oil, the alabaster jar, and how we allow things to tell us our worth, but we have to pour that out to Jesus. We have to pour that out at his feet and allow him to tell us what our worth is and where that worth comes from, that we don't find that in other things, we don't find that in other relationships, we find that solely in our relationship with God. And so that happened on Wednesday. On Thursday, what happens is you have the Last Supper, and you have Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Olive Grove, and, and prays. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning as we kind of wrap this part of the series up. And then next Sunday, with it being Easter Sunday, obviously, we're going to talk about the empty grave and what that means for us on how God fills us now that that grave is empty, now that we're empty of all of these things that we've been talking about, of this fast as we've been going through it. Now uh, we, we get to talk about the joy of being full with the right things. But that's next week, so a little promo there for you. <laughs> this week, though, we're going to talk about this last step of pouring out myself and the importance of pouring out me, that it's no longer me, that I'm the most important. It's about God. 
And, and Jesus models that for us so beautifully during his last few hours with his disciples. This is Thursday night. He's going to be arrested later on that, that night, overnight. He's going to be taken to trials on Friday um, through, through the overnight hours into the morning. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be mocked. He's going to go through the crucifixion on Friday. But on Thursday... This is what Jesus does. And it's amazing to me, this is his last acts, right? This is important because Jesus knew he only had a few more hours, knew he only had a, a little bit of time left with the disciples before he was going to be arrested, before their whole world was going to be turned upside down. And this is what he taught them. This is what he modeled for them. So I know we've been in Mark's gospel throughout most of this series. I want to start off this morning, though, looking at the gospel of John chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn and follow with me there uh, or look it up on your phone. John chapter 13. We're going to pick up in verse 1. <laughs> John chapter 13, verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around them. This is what Jesus does in one of his last acts before crucifixion. He washes the feet of the disciples. And as I was looking these last couple of weeks, kind of studying up for the sermon, I started researching just kind of, okay, what does it mean to wash somebody's feet? How does that work? What was the point of it? The historical context, right? It's important to know historical context when you're looking at the Bible or else we miss things oftentimes. So just a little background on foot washing. It was a common practice all throughout the Middle East during that time. And what would happen is because water was not readily available, they weren't able to bathe like head to toe. Crystal talked about this a little bit last week, um, you know, on a regular basis. When they would come into a house, it was customary for, for whoever was the host, whoever lived in that house, when a guest would come in, to have a servant there to wash their feet because they all wore sandals, open-toed sandals. They let their dogs hang out, as my kids <laughs> like to say, um, as the kids say these days. Um, <laughs> So their feet were just nasty, dirty. Everything was like dirt roads. Uh, you know, wasn't like a nice paved path everywhere. And all sorts of things traveled those roads. It wasn't just people walking or, or pulling carts. There were oxen. There were goats. There were sheep. There were donkeys. There were horses. All sorts of things that left things behind them as they walked down the road that would get stepped in and trampled. And so when you went into a house, it was customary to take your sandals off and your feet would be washed so you wouldn't be tracking that stuff all through the house, right? Just a very practical thing to do. And so it was common, but the, the thing that starts getting interesting is when you, when you look up the research is it was always done by like the lowliest of servants. It was that servant's job who was the newest, who was the lowliest, who was the bottom of the totem pole to wash people's feet. And, and more often than not, it was done by a female slave by a female servant of some sort. And so just picture like the, the scene as this is happening. They all go to this house that Jesus had sent the disciples, a couple of the disciples to earlier, said, go find this place. There's going to be a room there that we can rent for the Passover meal. So they find it just as Jesus said. They all come in and there is over in the corner, there's a big bowl, a basin, and there's a pitcher of water there for, for their feet to be washed. But there's not a servant there to do it. And so I can just picture all of the disciples as they come in, like it's just like this big glaring, you know, the elephant in the corner of the room, like, who's, who's going to wash feet? Like, it's not Peter, it's not going to be me. 
I'm the leader. You know, John's like, I'm the beloved disciple. I'm not going to wash feet. And Matthew's like, well, I'm a tax collector. I was an important government official. And they're all looking at Thaddeus because who knows anything about Thaddeus, right? Like, it's got to be Thaddeus or maybe James the Less. It's in his name. Like, you're the less, you're the least, you have to wash feet. They're all like eyeing each other, like, who's going to wash feet? Who's going to do it? <laughs> Nobody's going to do it. Nobody's getting up to offer themselves in that way. And so you have all this, but then along with all of this, there's a couple other things that I found out that I thought were really interesting about foot washing. In the Jewish culture, not only was it usually done by the lowliest of servant, a female, it was against the law if you were a Jewish servant in a Jewish household for that master to make you wash his feet because it was considered too low for Jews to do. You had to be a foreigner. So even, even like a lower level than that. But, but one of the interesting things that I found is that in a Jewish household, a, a husband and wife, didn't matter how rich they were, didn't matter how many servants they had, the wife would always wash the feet of her husband when he would return home from work. Everybody calm down, ladies. This is not a submit to your husband's <laughs> sermon, right? That's not what I'm preaching this morning. We'll save that for Mother's Day. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. No. Um, but it, it wasn't a, a submission thing. It was done as an act of love and intimacy. It didn't matter how many servants they had in their house, didn't matter how rich they were, the wife as an act of love and intimacy with her husband would always wash her husband's feet. The other thing that I thought was really neat is in the Jewish temple, in the priesthood, if you were a Jewish priest, you, you worked on a rotation. So you would come to the temple on a rotation, like one month you would be there, one month you would be at home. And, and, but when you would come, before you would get to the temple, you would bathe from head to toe, you would put on your priestly garments, and then you would go to, to the temple, to the temple courtyard. But before you could actually enter into the temple itself, to perform your priestly duties, there was a basin outside of the temple, and you had to sit and wash your feet as the last act of, of purification before you started ministering. Before you were able to do what God had chosen you to do, you had to wash your feet. So with all of those customs in mind, with all of those things, think about what Jesus was doing in that moment. John says it here, in, in verse 1, he had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. Jesus washed his disciples' feet as a sign of his love for them. And I love it. I love it. I, I, I'm amazed by it. That he even washed Judas' feet. It was all 12 of them. Judas doesn't leave until verse 27 later on in the chapter. Think about that interaction for a moment. It says right there, the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. He already knew what he was going to do. He had already made the deal with the Pharisees. He already knew there was a group of soldiers just waiting for him to show up and bring them to Jesus. And here Jesus comes and he bows down and he begins to wash Judas' feet. I can't like comprehend that kind of love and service to somebody who is actively trying to hurt you. <laughs> I can't comprehend that. And I think about like on Judas' part, like what was going through his mind in that moment? Like you know he couldn't make eye contact with Jesus. Like you know he had to be sitting there just guilt <laughs> ridden in that moment, but Jesus washed his feet still as an act of love, as an act of intimacy, as an act of showing them, I love you this much, I'm going to wash your feet. That kind of love is hard. <laughs> it's hard to understand. It's even harder to model, though, right? That we're called to love like some of us can't even look at somebody if we know they said something bad about us. Like if you have somebody who has, who has talked bad behind your back, like it, we have a hard time even like acknowledging that person. 
Jesus went and washed his feet. (laughs) That's the kind of love that Jesus had for his disciples. So he washed all their feet, even Judas, as a sign of his love. He washed their feet as a preparation for ministry. Let's go on these next three verses here. Uh, Verse 6 says, When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Big surprise, Peter has to say something, right? Like, that's if there's anything you learn from the Gospels, it's that Peter can't keep his mouth shut. He always has to say something. So Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to, be, does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. You see what he's doing there? He's referencing that tradition of the priest. He even tells Peter, you don't understand now what I'm doing <laughs> but I'm preparing you for ministry. I'm washing your feet. I've already washed your hands and your head with my words. You've already been baptized by John the Baptist. You've already been cleansed, that side of thing. But this is the last act that needs to be done in order to prepare you for the ministry that I have called you to. <laughs> this is the last thing, the last cleansing that needs to happen. And then you are going to go enter the ministry, enter the temple, be the temple that I've called you to be. He washes their feet, all of them, as a preparation for the ministry that they're about to enter. If you go on to verse uh, 12 there, it says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I love these verses because when you go back to the beginning of the chapter, verse 3 says, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything. And that he had come from God and would return to God. So, he got up from the table. Stop and think about this a moment. Jesus knew who he was, obviously. He knew he was God in human form. He knew he was the word that created all of creation. He knew who he was, that he had come from God, and he knew where he was going, (laughs) He knew he was returning to God. He knew first he was going to have to suffer horribly. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to be humiliated. He knew all of those things, but he knew where he was going. He knew God had given him all authority on heaven and earth. And because of that, so he got up. So he took off his robe. So he poured water in the basin. So he wrapped the towel around his waist. So he began to wash their feet. It didn't matter to him what else was going on. He did it. He washed their feet as a sign of selflessness. (laughs) Because that's what we're supposed to do. That's who we're supposed to be. He goes on, like I said, and he tells them, you call me Lord and you call me teacher, and that's right, because that's what I am. But since I have washed your feet, you should also wash each other's feet. Now, is he telling us that every Sunday we need to have a bowl and come around and wash each other's feet? No, it's not needed. It's not a practical thing for us anymore, right? Some of you, maybe. Need to wash your feet? (laughs) But it's not the same thing as what Jesus was doing. What he's saying is that we are called to selflessly love others the way that he was selflessly loving them. And he doesn't just use do this as an example for them. Everything he did was an example of that. Jesus came from God. He didn't want to come to earth. 
You think that was like on Jesus' bucket list is to come and be born and leave heaven and all the glory behind and come and be born here on earth? He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to have to go through the ministry on earth and deal with all of the stupidity of his disciples and the people around them and all the people trying to attack him. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to wash their feet. Who wants to wash feet, right? Like, what was that movie? There's a line in a movie where somebody says, I want you to want to wash the dishes. There's a couple arguing, and the guy goes, why would I want to wash dishes? Nobody wants to wash dishes, right? Like, he didn't want to do that. He didn't want to come and suffer and die the way he did, but we needed it, and so he did it. That's how much he loves us. That's the example that he has given us to follow, that it's not about what I want. Jesus is saying it's not about what I want. It's not about what I deserve. It's not about what my rights are. I give all of that up because you need a way to be restored to your relationship with God. And so I am going to do everything I can in my power to make sure that you get what you need. That's the kind of love we're called to have. That's the example that we're called to follow. We have a hard time sometimes coming into church because the band isn't playing the types of songs that we like to hear. It's not about what I want. It's about what somebody else needs. (laughs) If we would live in that sort of way, if we would live that mindset it wouldn't matter to us when we get together on Sundays what kind of music is being played what the decorations are how the speaker is dressed it wouldn't matter because it's not about my own personal preference it's about what people need in order to be closer to God that's how we're to approach each other that's how we're called to do it it reminds me of the story in Genesis the story of creation in Genesis chapter 2 Jesus or God talks about how he created Adam and he created Eve and there's a verse in there that I always laughed at you know when you're a little kid and you're reading the Bible and it says and he created the male and female and they were naked but they knew no shame I thought that's weird (laughs) why would God put that in the Bible (laughs) like why do we have to know they were naked (laughs) but we believe right second Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching and correcting. So there's no wasted space in the Bible. All scripture is useful. And as you read through that story, when Adam and Eve sin, when they take the bite of the fruit, it says the first thing that happened is it says their eyes were open and they realized they were naked and they went and found leaves to sew together to cover their nakedness. I've always thought, man, why? What what are you trying to show us there, God? Here's what I believe God wants us to realize. Is that when we're created, the way that we're supposed to be, the way that God intended us for us to be, is to not even really be (laughs) self-aware. To be so focused on the others around us that it doesn't even occur to us what our needs are. (laughs) what, What we look like. What we think we should be like doesn't even occur to us because we're so focused on loving others the way that we're called to love others that it doesn't even occur to us that we're naked (laughs) we're just focused on loving somebody the way that we're supposed to love them that's the way adam and eve i believe were created is they were so focused on each other so focused on on fulfilling the need of the other as opposed to what they wanted they didn't even realize it There was no self-awareness there that they were naked because they were completely selfless. And that's the way God created us to be. I believe that what happened is when when Adam took the bite of the apple, not the apple, I don't know what kind of fruit it was, whatever fruit it was, the fig, the whatever it is, he took the bite of it. All sin, I firmly believe, is selfishness. All sin boils down to I want this and it doesn't matter what God wants it doesn't matter what my neighbor wants I want this for me and the reason I believe it happened with Adam is is because Adam knew like 
my own personal opinion on this is that Adam, Adam was there. The Bible says, read it in Genesis chapter 2, says Adam was there when the serpent tempted Eve and he didn't intervene. I think it was because he wanted to see whether or not she would die. He wanted that fruit. He wanted to taste it, but he wasn't willing to risk it himself, so he let his wife risk it first. Notice saw that she didn't drop dead immediately and then thought, I'll try some of that too. That act of selfishness of, I want this. I don't care how it affects anybody else. I don't care how it affects my relationship with God. That's what sin does, and it makes you become self-aware. <laughs> because it's an act of turning your eyes from where they should be, focused on God and focused on others, right? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. It turns that focus from outward to inward, <laughs> And that's when he noticed he was naked, when he acted on that selfishness. So we're called as Christians in this, in this example by Jesus to love others selflessly. Now, don't show up to church naked next week, <laughs> right? We all live under the burden of sin still, so be self-aware in that way still. <laughs> But let's love others the way that we're called to love others. Let's put others' needs and wants ahead of our own needs and wants. That's the kind of love, the kind of selflessness that Jesus modeled for us and therefore the kind of selflessness that we should have towards everybody else. It shouldn't be about what you want, right? So if you need to hear this, husbands, what does your wife need? Wives, what does your husband need? Parents, what do your kids need? Christian, what does your neighbor need? It doesn't matter if it's what you want. It doesn't matter if you think it's worth it. It doesn't matter if you believe that, that that's what you should do. It's about loving others above yourself and putting that into action, regardless of how they treat you. Regardless of what they say about you, regardless of whether they're planning your demise like Judas was, Jesus still loved him that much, still put his needs in front of his own. And I just, I, I, I think about that and I think, man, that's the kind of love that we're called to have. That's the kind of action. Jesus says, they will, the world will know you are my disciples by how you love each other. Are you loving like Jesus loved? Are you loving selflessly like Jesus loved? We're going to go to Mark chapter 14 and... Um, Jesus, they, he washes their, their feet. They have their meal together. It's where we get communion. We're going to talk about that on Friday. Take communion together at our, our Good Friday service. So I want to invite you again. Make sure you're here for that. It's going to be an amazing time. We're going to kind of skip over that for today, this morning. And we're going to go to Mark chapter 14, verse 32. They finish up their meal. They leave the upper room. And it says in Mark chapter 14, verse 32, they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Man, I think we skip over this too many times. We focus on triumphal entry, and we focus on the death and resurrection. But in this moment, Jesus is so grief-stricken, so distressed, so fighting his own flesh. that it says, he, he tells his disciples, sit here, I need to go pray. And he takes Peter, James, and John with him, and he goes on, and it, it's like he's so physically burdened by what he knows he's going to go through he takes a couple steps and he just falls to the ground and he begins weeping he's so mentally anguished in this moment by what is happening that that he just he can't even take another step 
And he just cries. But I love what Jesus does here because it's such an amazing example for us. He says, stay here and keep watch with me. He turns to his three closest friends, his three disciples, as the creator of the universe, and he asks them to pray for him. That's what he's saying by stay here and keep watch. Stay and pray for me. The creator of the universe. God in human flesh asked for prayer. How much more do we need to ask for prayer? How much more do we need to go to others? He's showing them by example. Again, I love it because Jesus is that ultimate good leader. You know, never going to ask you to do something that he hasn't done himself. (laughs) He's saying, I need prayer. Pray with me. As the creator, as the master, as the teacher, turning to his disciples and asking them to pray for him in that moment. Because he's so distressed. He's so anxious and bothered. Maybe not anxious. So struggling with what he knows is going to take place. Down, If you go down the next verse, verse... uh, 35 and 36 it says he went on a little farther and fell to the ground he prayed that if it were possible the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by abba father he cried out everything is possible for you please take this cup of suffering away from me yet i want your will to be done and not mine think about in that moment again like i said earlier Jesus knew. He knew what was going to happen. He knew Judas was coming around that corner with hundreds of soldiers. He knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew he was going to be taken and tied up to the house of the high priest and tried illegally by the Jewish council overnight. He knew he was going to be mocked and slapped and ridiculed. He knew he was going to be dragged to Pilate's house where he was going to be beaten, where he's going to be whipped, where he's going to have a crown of thorns drove onto his head. He knew he was going to be punched repeatedly over and over by the soldiers. He knew he was going to have to carry a cross and then be nailed and die on that cross. He knew what was coming. He knew exactly what the next hours were going to bring. Yet he still prays, I want your will to be done, not mine. And it reminds me of the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, how God gives Joseph the dream, right, of his brothers coming and bowing down before him. And then his brothers and his mom and dad coming and bowing down. And he's like, oh, this is awesome. This is great. And then all of the other things happen before that dream takes place. Like sometimes we, God gives us those dreams and we're like, God, you know, I just want to know how am I going to get from here to there? I want to know, like we want God to lay out all those steps. Not knowing is a blessing sometimes. <laughs> Not a curse. Can you imagine if God would have showed Joseph everything he was going to have to go through like Joseph would have been like wait my brothers are gonna throw me in a pit sell me off as a slave I'm gonna have to go to Egypt where I don't know anybody I'm gonna have to work my tail off work my way up through this house and then I'm gonna be falsely accused of rape and thrown into prison and forgotten about for two years no thanks <laughs> I'm out <laughs> I don't want that And sometimes we pray, God, show us how it's going to happen. And we want like that step-by-step thing. And we think it's going to look like this. I'm sure you guys have all seen that cartoon. No, it looks like this. Ups and downs and all over and all the trials and things. It's never going to be as smooth. But Jesus knew. (laughs) He knew every step of the way. He knew everything he was going to have to suffer. He knew before he even came to earth. Yet he still came. Yet he still prayed, not my will, but your will be done, Father. That's the kind of love that God has for us. That's the kind of love that Jesus showed us, not just in the garden, not just at the Last Supper, but at the cross. That's what Jesus was showing his disciples that was most important. 
the last few hours of his life, this is what I believe he was teaching them, is one, submit to the will of God. Submit to God's will above everything else. When he teaches his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he starts it off with, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you willing to submit to the will of God in your life? James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit yourself to God's will. Submit yourself to what he wants from you and for you. Not what you want. Not what you think is going to be right. Not your plans. Not your will. Submit to God's will. The second thing is he shows them is submit to each other. In washing their feet and putting their needs in front of his own. And then telling them then to do the same for each other. He's saying submit to each other. I love how Romans chapter 12 verses 9 and 10 puts it. It says don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. <laughs> Don't just say it. Do it. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. I love that last phrase. Take delight in honoring each other. <laughs> Man, what a simple statement. But what a profound concept. But it should bring you joy and happiness to honor someone above yourself. It should bring you fulfillment to serve someone else. Anybody who's, who's ever gone on a, on a missions trip <laughs> will tell you that's the truth. That you go thinking you're going to go help, but what ends up happening is God changes you as you serve. <laughs> When you serve in the church, when whatever capacity it is, whether it's in kids or in here in any way, when you serve and you put others' desires, others' needs in front of your own, when you submit yourself to them in love, it brings fulfillment, it brings joy, it brings peace in your life. There is, it's not just something Jesus said, man, it, he modeled it for us and he shows us that it works. <laughs> Submit yourselves, honor each other. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21 says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to each other. Think of others higher than yourself. Submit and love each other out of reverence for Christ because that's what Christ did. Because that's what Jesus showed us we should do. And so we should do those things. The last thing I believe he was showing them was, it's okay to ask for help. <laughs> it's okay to ask for help. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 7 says, a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Why? So we can help each other. <laughs> Man, I don't know how many times in my life, growing up in church, I've been sitting thinking, oh, I, I need to go pray. I need to go to the altar. I need somebody to pray with me. I need somebody to, to agree with me on prayer. I just need to go and get prayed with. And, and I fight it. And I think, oh, no, I can't. I can't because what, what are people going to think? <laughs> I can't because I don't, I don't want to admit my weakness. I let my pride get in the way. I let my, my thoughts of what other people are going to think get in the way of what I know I should be doing. And so I sit there in silence and suffering because of my own prideful nature <laughs> instead of going and doing what we're called to do. <laughs> Growing up as a Pentecostal kid in a Pentecostal church, like we all love the gifts of the Spirit, the speaking in tongues and the gifts of prophecy and the gifts of knowledge. But do you know that in Romans chapter 12, Paul says that encouragement is a gift of the Spirit. 
that hosting someone in your house is a gift of the Spirit, that, that teaching all of these different things, and we love to focus on these big ones, but each one of us are given a gift so that we can help each other, but we never ask for help. <laughs> we think, oh no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Somebody ask you how you're doing? I'm fine. I had, Crystal and I had this conversation early in our marriage where I told her, hey, if I ask you, are you okay, and you say I'm fine, I don't care how you say it and what tone you say it, I'm going to continue to operate as if things are fine. <laughs> so if I say, are you okay, and you say, I'm fine, I'm going to assume you're fine, <laughs> unless you tell me differently, <laughs> right? Like, I'm not going to play that game. <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing that. So if there's something wrong, tell me there's something wrong so I can fix my stupidity and, and get it right. But if you tell me it's fine, I'm going to assume it's fine. <laughs> but that's how we treat each other all the time in church. Ask somebody, how you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, just, just living life, just busy. Just, just doing what I have to do. When the Bible says we're each given a gift to help each other, to pray for each other, to hold each other up, to encourage each other, to love on each other. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. What the writer of Hebrews is saying in that moment is when we get together, we get together to build each other up. We get together to love on each other, to encourage each other, to, to motivate each other. Some of you need a swift kick in the butt sometimes. That's what we're called to do in a way here at church, right? Like to motivate each other, to do what we're called to do, to help each other. James says in chapter 5, when you're sick, call the elders together to pray for you, to anoint you with oil. Because... The prayer of a righteous man, to go King James on you, availeth much, does a lot of good, will we'll hit its mark. It's okay to ask for help. It's okay to be vulnerable. Jesus did it. The Creator did it. It's okay for you to admit you're weak. It's okay for you to admit you're strong dealing with your flesh it's exactly what jesus was saying in my flesh god father i don't want to go through with this in my flesh i don't want to have to deal with this but god your will be done not mine and he asked for prayer so why can't we as our musicians come the worship team comes back up this is what it means to pour out yourself. Because we live in a culture that says, it's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's all about what I need, what I feel. Find your truth. Whatever you decide you are, that's what you are. <laughs> we live in a culture that's all about self-fulfillment. And that's the exact opposite of what Jesus said we should be as Christians. He doesn't say, go and do what makes you happy. He doesn't say, go and do what fulfills you and gives you joy. He says, take up your cross daily and follow me. He doesn't say to just live your life however you want to live your life. He orders us to live selflessly, sacrificially loving others and putting others above ourselves. That's why we can't buy in to the culture of the day because that's not what the Bible says. It's not what Jesus did for us. And if we're called to be like Jesus, we need to act like Jesus. It's not okay to just say, well, I, I don't love that person anymore, so I'm going to divorce them. It's not what the Bible says. It's not okay to just toss out relationships, to, to say, well, this is what I want and what I feel, and, and I don't care what anybody else says. We have to pour out ourselves. 
We have to say, God, it's not about me anymore. It's not about my will. It's about your will. God, help me to love you and submit to you the way I know I'm supposed to. But God, help me to love and submit to my Judas. (laughs) Mm. That's a hard prayer. God, help me to love and submit to my neighbor, to my spouse, to my friends, to my family, to my co-workers that really annoy me with their popping gum all the time. God, help me to love them the way that you would love them. And when we do that, when we submit ourselves to God and we submit ourselves to others, that's when we become like Christ. That is what Christ wanted us to know more than anything else at the end of his life, at the last second, the cram session before the test was he showed them love selflessly. Put God's will first above everything else. Man, I think back, Crystal and I were talking this last week, we were looking at our Facebook memories and it was a year ago this last week that we came and tried out. March 26th, in two days, was the day that we were voted on. Some of you were here that night. (laughs) And uh, Daniel McMillan, you guys did the vote, called me on the phone, I think had it on speakerphone over the, the, the system, and said, hey, we voted yes. And I heard everybody clap, and I said, I'm gonna need a minute. (laughs) It was a little awkward, I'm sure. We needed to talk for a minute as a family. And I'll tell you, we had spiritual warfare that night. Because it would have been easier for us to stay in Joplin. It would have been easier for us to stay in Missouri where all of our family was, where all of our friends were, where we had jobs. (laughs) It would have been easier. But what we came away with from that night after spending some time in in some deep prayer was, God, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. And we had to submit our will to God's will. We have to love each other in that same way. Not my will. What do you need? What do you need? And be willing to be vulnerable enough when somebody asks you to say, I need you (laughs) to help me. I need you to pray for me. I need you to agree with me in this moment. That's the beautiful example that Jesus gives us on the last day of his life here on earth. The last night before he was arrested and betrayed and died. He submitted So as we stand this morning, we're going to go back into a song and and spend some time in worship, but I want to encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to show you where you need to pour yourself out, where you need to pour out your will, where you need to pour out your own pride, your own selfishness and we're all there I don't stand up here saying I've mastered this I struggle with it every day but continue to pray and ask God to help you our prayer teams are going to come up and join us and if you need them to pray with you do it it's okay it's encouraged it's what we need let's spend some time this morning as we end Asking God to show us those areas in our life and then stepping out in action to do what he's called us to do.
took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending reckless of God. Oh, it changed.
there's nothing you would not do because your love demands it. God, you've done so much for us. You've modeled for us everything that we need. And so, God, my prayer this morning is that we would, first of all, understand how great, how wide, how deep, how amazing your love is. God, even though it's beyond our, our true comprehension, God, that we would just begin to understand how amazing your love is for us. God, that you gave up everything. That you laid aside your will, Jesus. That you submitted yourself to the will of the Father and you submitted yourself to our needs. God, help us to understand that type of love. But God, help us to exemplify that type of love. God, that we would not be a group that just receives, but that we would be a group that gives that love to others. God, that we would follow the example of your son. That we would submit our wills to yours. That we would submit to one another. God, that we would hold each other up and serve each other. That we would help each other. But God, that your love would be evident in our lives. Jesus, that your love would overflow out of our lives to everyone we come in contact. God, help us to understand your love and to love like you have loved us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Be here this Friday night at 7 o'clock. We're going to have an awesome time of worship, prayer, and word. And going to have a blast afterwards with our kids. Hope to see you all there.